Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for this episode of Threat Talk. I'm your host, Bob Hansman, and today's episode is Grading Threat Intelligence on a Curve Part 2. Now, on Episode 5 last month, we aired Part 1 without knowing that it was actually going to become part of a multi-series or multi-part series, but the response was fantastic, and with requests to, for us to kind of get into some other angles of how threat intelligence is used in security. Now, if you listen to that episode, you'll see that it was heavily focused on getting the most out of threat intelligence to help you block more threats. So today, we're back and going to talk about how to maximize threat intelligence for investigation and response. And we're fortunate to have Drew McFarlane, the Senior Product Manager for Security and Analytics at Infobox, to return and continue that discussion. So thank you for joining us again, Drew. Thank you for having me, Bob. It's great to be here. Well, I thought we would probably start our conversation pretty much where we left off. So here's my scenario. Somebody has their optimal mix of various threat feeds. You know, they've got that right balance, good detection, not too many false positives. And then they get an alert that something on their network tried to connect to something bad, you know, try to go somewhere bad. Um, where are they going to start? What's the first thing they're going to want to know? Well, you know, the, the difficulty that any incident response team has is the fact that they are, uh, you know, they traditionally have a, a deluge of different alerts that they have to try to address. So a lot of what they have to start with is just triage and, you know, what needs my attention most and what things can I safely, I don't want to say ignore, but maybe deprioritize. I mean, you think about the, the attack that ended up happening at, uh, at Sony uh, a few years ago. You know, they were seeing about 100,000 alerts every month, and they had a limited number of incident responders. So how do you really go through that? So you, you have to start off with what are, you know, you know what are the, the, the events that most need my attention? And sometimes those aren't even necessarily the ones with the highest severity. Uh, sometimes they have to do a little bit more with, um, you know, like the context of, of what they're doing. Uh, I like to think about you know, threat intelligence, especially you know, different types of alerts from a standpoint of the kill chain, or you know, I, I have this model that I, you know, I sort of liken to the redshift blue shift uh, uh, technique, where the, the center point is the point where you actually get compromised. So you know, a lot of the times when you have this deluge of alerts, a lot of them are the security equipment that you have just reporting that they're doing their job. You know, we block somebody from downloading this bad thing. If it's blocked and and everything is okay, that's fine. You can safely, you're like, okay, that's a point of concern, but it's nothing I have to send one of my incident responders out to. What would be more troubling is an indicator like a command and control, which is more indicative of the fact that they've already been compromised and now they have to try to address it. So a lot of what the incident responder is trying to do is, is kind of sift through not just the severity, how bad is this thing in and of itself, but also... What is the context? Is this a an alert that shows that maybe a compromise has already occurred, or is it something that you know just is basically the the security equipment telling you that they've done their job? Well, now that context that you mentioned, the context would also be like whose device is it? Because you know I might panic more if it's the CFO's laptop versus it's that desktop that we keep in the conference room that's not even really on the main network. You know, so the device yeah. involved, the user involved, all those factors come into play too, don't they? Absolutely. And again, you know, going into another uh, another event that everybody's probably aware of is, you know, when Target got breached a few years ago, it was their point of sales terminals. And the nice thing about point of sales terminals is they have a very de deterministic uh, view of the world. I mean, like there's only certain things that they're supposed to do. They're not surfing the web. They're not browsing for things. They're not you know, taking a lunch break and then going onto YouTube. So, you know, there's very specific things that they end up doing. Now, if a point of sales terminal does anything out of the ordinary, whether it's, you know, visiting some site that, you know, is downloading mm -hmm. a, a, a piece of malware or a command and control or basically anything, you want to know about it. That is the most important uh, thing right? You know, in and of itself that you have to be, you know, that's probably the most important event. Higher priority than almost anything other than maybe the CFO's uh, you know, laptop getting uh, getting compromised. But you know, this is you know, you really have to maybe start you know, start taking an accounting with uh, you know when you look at the different devices that are on your on your network. What is the value of the asset itself? You know, the 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 you know the C suite is going to be of a higher value sometimes than than you know, obviously as you said a a device that might be 
connected to a guest network inside of the conference room, that device is going to be gone and you're not going to have much of an opportunity to even address it, even if it was something that was potentially uh, uh, malicious. So yeah, again, all those things, having a good understanding as to what you're protecting will help you figure out what you need to prioritize. So the security team is actually depending also a lot, and we, we've talked about this also a little bit last time, where they're depending on the networking team to have done a lot of their work up front. Is Active Directory being fully used? Are they populating it with the information that we might need to reference real quick to be able to identify that, you know, this device, um, you know, what's its purpose? Who's the owner? Where might it be physically? And if they don't have that information, then using something like an IP address uh, management solution, an IPAM solution that can collect that information automatically to help you not only know that it's a particular device um, that we've identified, but where is it on my network? What is it connected to? Uh, particularly today where most of these devices are mobile. I mean, both the issued ones yeah. like the laptops, but also the BYOD stuff. Um, and then it occurs to me now that I'm using acronym, uh, you know, spaghetti here. We've also got IOT and the OT and, and all these things that there's and really not even see. a yeah. user for it. Yeah, absolutely. And, and, you know, um, and again, one of the big challenges that uh, the security team, a CISO, or, or any of these other people end up having is, you know, you drive into uh, work in the morning and you find out some new threat that just came across uh, the wire where some network camera uh, just got, you know, got some sort of a new exploit that they did, uh, determined. And that's great. You, you have all the details of how to test for it, but you have no idea whether or not that camera even exists inside of your environment. So, you know, being able to start, you know, the, the more information you have at, at, you know, to bear when you go into this from a standpoint of, you know, what assets are on my, on my network, how well populated, as you mentioned, uh, your Active Directory is, anything that's going to allow you to triangulate enough information to be able to analyze and scope and determine, you know, Am I really being impacted by this? Is this really a threat? You know, if you have a, a piece of malware that gets downloaded and you have the context to know that this is a really, really nasty, be a high severity piece yeah. of malware that attacks Windows 95. If I have no Windows 95 devices on my network, I'm probably safe regardless of the fact that it got downloaded. Well, and that kind of gets to the patch point. I mean, we just uh, you know had Microsoft Patch Tuesday, which was a really good one, I think, for uh, a lot of people to to get a, a wake up call. You, you may have known about it before, but this one was really good. There were thirteen big things they patched, but they patched them in a half a dozen different systems. It wasn't just Windows patches. Um, you know, we had um, you know online systems, uh, the DNS server. There was actually a patch for the Microsoft DNS server. Um, all of these systems uh, are involved, and yet, other than the Windows uh, laptop systems, they're not managed. They're um, and some of them were spun up. I know that I've worked with uh, customers um, both uh, during my tenure here at Infoblox and as previous companies over the last thirty years. The the one thing that never ceases to amaze me is how often they can be surprised that what we have a another server over here that somebody spun up to work on or. Uh, all of a sudden they find a whole bunch of IOT devices that a particular department started rolling out. And they remember having a call with somebody in IT who said, yeah, yeah, those should be fine. And then they just went and bottom rolled them out. And then of course, you know, you've got your Wi-Fi networks where, well, this is the one for guests when they come have them connect to this one, but this is the internal one that your laptop's supposed to connect to. Yeah. But I'm going to use my phone on that one too, right? The, my, my BYOD phone on the internal company. You can't trust employees. They're still the number one weakness in your network. And um, trying to keep track of just the devices that they're bringing in. I think I gave the example uh, before of uh, a company that found their bandwidth getting chewed up. And it was because all of a sudden um, somebody brought in a baby monitor that was streaming from the preschool that their kids were at. Other people looked at it and said, hey, that's a great idea. Everybody started bringing those in, putting them on their laptop, and you had you know, 50, 60 people streaming live high-res feeds all of a sudden, yeah. and nobody even knew those devices were there until the way I even got into this story, they got compromised um, for a yeah. DDoS attack. Somebody compromised all those devices. It wasn't even attacking the company, but all of a sudden that company's systems were attacking another company. And um, this is where attribution in attacks gets to be interesting. We'll get into that on another on another podcast. But um, you know, they only found out when somebody called them and said, "Hey, why are you attacking our our servers?" 
<laughs> so yeah, yeah the and, devices. And the thing it, is, yeah. Go ahead. Yeah, the, the the difficulty behind this as well is uh, yeah, the 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 actual attack surfaces has expanded just exponentially over the last of several years, and you know. Um, obviously, the reasons for that are numerous, but you know one of the big impactors is the proliferation of ransomware. And the th reason why I say that is ransomware itself changed the dynamics of uh, of your tra uh, traditional attack. I mean, there used to be a couple of motives for for you know, uh, you know any sort of breach. There was you know maybe financial if you you know if you're going in after a corporate resource or whatever or espionage. Sometimes it was um, you know deliberate sabotage or, or or sort of hacktivism, et cetera. Um, the, the ability that ransomware has introduced in terms of adding a financial dynamic that had never really been there before has just made it really attractive and really lucrative for people to go in and try and find whatever you know entree that they could. And you're like, so it's great that you have a good firewall. You know, knowing that you have a great firewall. It's just basically, yeah. you know, it's, it's, it's kind of like the, you know, you got that wall. It's just going to make people have to walk a little bit farther around. So, you know, even, mm -hmm. even as of uh, earlier this week, or I think it was last week where uh, there was a new uh, exploit that was discovered. You know, if you, you know, if you were on an iOS device and you clicked on a LinkedIn, you know, like the fact that people are going into every single little app and trying to find, you know, what is the weakest link that will allow me in? Um, you know, that was never really a possibility before because, you know, there's always that risk versus reward. You know, like, you know, how much effort do I have to exert and what is the reward? And the reward was never as good as it mm -hmm. has been recently with, uh, with ransomware. So it's, it's, you know, really produced this entire, um, you know, wave of people looking and analyzing every single possible entree into a network that was never really worthwhile going after before. So, you know, as a result, you know, all these different things that that a, uh, a network ends up being you know, having introduced, like the baby monitors, the the new app that you're running, you know, the BYO, uh, BYOL, etc. All those things are just one more thing that the network manager has to has to try to you know account for and manage for, and you can't protect what you don't know is there. So. You know, you really have to go in and uh, and have a good foundational understanding of what you're protecting, and that you know that goes from understanding what assets are on your network, having a good map of what they are, where they are. You know, sometimes the release versions. You know, who are actually using it. You know, what are the identities? What are the roles that they end up? You know, what things should they be doing, and what things shouldn't they? There's just so much more that a, a incident response team now has to take into account in order to be able to effectively do their job. Yeah, years ago at Black Hat, um, this kind of came to mind because I'm also uh, offline getting ready for Black Hat, uh, which right now it's only a few weeks away. But I uh, uh -huh. remember attending a talk years ago where the guy was showing, um, you know, hey, here's the official set of pen tools, uh, pen test tools that most of you are using. Here's some that are not that popular that I think you should be using. And one of them was uh, basically a network based audit tool. And he was showing how he could use that. And he did it live at Black Hat on the Black Hat Wireless Network. And he was able to come back and give a report right now. Here's all the devices that are on it. Here's the version of Java that they all have, which was interesting because I, I seem to remember it was 80 something, 87, 88% of all the devices currently connected to that Black Hat Network had outdated versions of Java. Um, which at the time it was because if you had a Java app, they typically only work with certain versions. So you couldn't always update your Java without breaking apps. But, um, you know, the bad guys tend to know more about your network than you do unless you're really proactive. So this is really good. And to close this topic out, I want, I want to move on, though, is, um, you know, we've been hearing about this, not just from like the individual presenters years ago that I got it from, but for the last few years, we've got Forrester talking about SASE. We've got, or excuse me, the Zero, Zero Trust Network. We've got Gartner talking about SASE. And they're all basically talking about how networking and security have to come together. And in the context of threat intelligence, you need that threat intelligence to understand, um, and you gave the example, is the behavior of that POS system at Target, is it going to someplace it should never go to? Is that camera or that you know nanny cam 
connecting to places it shouldn't. Any anomalous behavior, just because it's not connecting to a command and control center doesn't mean that it's safe. <laughs> um, and so understanding your baselines, your bottom line is you just got to have some visibility here. And um, if you don't currently have the tools to give you the visibility, you're already behind the curve on your threat intelligence. And that was an unintended yeah. pun on the title of this. So um, <laughs> yeah, no, let's it, move on uh, here and, because we've been talking yeah, a lot yeah, about okay. reactionary. Oh, I'm sorry. Did you have a thought on that? No, no, no. Yeah, go, go on. Yeah, let's move on to the next topic. Let's move on. So, yeah. So we've been talking about reactive. What about more proactive stuff? You know, mostly people throw it out, you know, threat hunting, which is a whole bunch of stuff. But if they are looking at more proactive, um, you know, what's involved in that? I mean, I don't have an incident to start with. So where do I start? So, so uh, well, you know, uh, if you have an incident um, that you're responding to, then almost by definition, it's not really threat hunting. Threat hunting is, you know, threat hunting is a wonderful, a wonderful concept. And for organizations who actually have the capability of delivering on it, it's great. Uh, it, it basically means that, you know, um, you know, well, it means this fairy tale of an organization who you know, has their network reasonably well under control and now they have the bandwidth and capacity to start looking for threats that may have evolved, you know, may have evaded some of their other uh, uh, security appliances and security equipment. I think that's, that's, I that's, think that's a LinkedIn uncommon. question. I, I think that's a LinkedIn yeah. question that somebody ought to put out. Is your network under control? <laughs> I'd love to see yeah, the response yeah. to that. No, yeah, and, and absolutely. So it's, you know, you end up, uh, you know, I think uh, there's a Ponemon uh, research thing where they discovered that you know, the, you know, for a lot of these breaches, they go undetected for six months um, before they actually get uh, discovered. SolarWinds was a, a prime example of that. That occurred for months before FireEye uh, finally discovered it and, and sort of announced it to the world. So it's, uh, it is very, very common for, and it's not the, the easy, you know, small ones. I mean, you're like ransomware doesn't go for months without being detected. It's usually these bad things that end up, you know, making national news and getting CISOs fired that end up uh, being like that. So th those are th those are the boogeymen that everybody wants to avoid. Nobody wants to find out I've been compromised for six months, 10 months or whatever. Uh, people have been extra exfiltrating data for months on end. So the idea behind threat hunting is really taking the, the data that you have available to be able to start looking at network behavior and looking for network behavior that is uh, very you know, sort of associated with uh, with malicious behavior, uh, and and there's a, a number of I mean you could probably put them up. And, you know, there's a number of uh, of like cookbooks for for you know, people who actually want to start experimenting with this. You know, threathunting.org and and some others, and I can I can provide those to you. But you know, basically, it's a what is the behavior that you end up looking for. That might be indicative of um, of something you know sort of associated with malicious behavior, uh, and a lot of those a lot of those techniques. I mean, obviously, the the you know, the more data that you have available, the better that is. So if you you know if you've got all this behavior data, maybe you've got a, an instance of bro set up that you know that's recording absolutely everything. It's great. Uh, it also means that you've got really deep pockets because you're probably spending so much money. Uh, sending, you know, uh, signing checks to Splunk, or or maybe you've stood up your own Elk stack to be able to start doing reports off of this stuff. It's all a really significant commitment to be on to being able to do that. However, you know, there's some basic stuff. You don't have to start with the perfect scenario. You know, just you know, for the people who are watching this, what you can uh, often do just with DNS logs or DHCP logs to try to figure out. You know what new things am I are popping up on my network? What what sites are my uh, uh, my uh, people visiting? You know, there's a lot that you can potentially do just with the data that you already have, the logs that you already have. But it's it's really it ends up being almost more of an exercise of uh, of you know what resources do you have available? Do you actually have the free time? So I, I liken it almost to you know uh, it sort of put it in, into psychological terms. They talk about how, you know, Maslow's hierarchy of needs, where you know you yeah. start off at the very bottom, you know, the base of this pyramid, and it's you know, like I'm in instant response mode. I'm just fighting fires. I'm you know my day is let me take a look at the at the ten people who downloaded something, and I'm running out there and I'm reimaging their PC just so that I can limp by until tomorrow. 
Uh, and then you know, from there you get on to, you know, I'm able to do that, but I'm also able to do some scoping. So, you know, maybe that piece of ransomware before it landed on this device spread itself to three or four other places and it's still hidden there. Now I have the ability to actually see who did that device interact with. And then you, as you go up this pyramid, the, the top of the pyramid is, uh, is being able to do threat hunting, actually being able to genuinely uh, be proactive and look for malicious behavior that might be avoiding detection by anything else because if it's a if it's a zero day or if it's a really well hidden uh, 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 attack, you know it may not be triggering anything malicious because remember the people who are doing these attacks uh, are just as familiar with what things are what signatures are available out there and they know how to avoid some of this stuff. So you know if they've got in. The things that you would imagine, typically, uh, you know, you know, the things that you would imagine being associated with malicious behavior, like, I've, you know, somebody got in, they're now trying to exfiltrate data. You would imagine that what you'd be looking for is just somebody all of a sudden sending these large chunks of data, and now they're they're the yeah. biggest talker on the network. That rarely happens. It's usually you know somebody who's like, oh, we actually got in. Uh, first step I'm going to do is make sure I've got a back door in here so that if I ever do get discovered, you know, I'm going to be able to, uh, you know, to get back in again afterwards. So, you know, maybe you're looking for people who are setting up accounts that, you know, don't, or shouldn't be, or, or in an unusual way. And then, you know, and then you'll end up getting these sort of low and slow, very throttled, uh, uh, file transfers that, aren't going to raise any red flags, but the fact that you've got this connection that stayed up for a week and a half doing a file transfer, that's not common, but you know, it's, it's, you know, you have to know what to look for. Those things aren't going to like, this guy isn't going to be ever, you know, showing up on your top 10 talkers and he's not going to, but the fact that you've got this really unusual file transfer, that's not, you know, a normal circumstance might be that indicator that you have to worry about. Well, and then there's those, um, uh, alerts that you get from like the FBI or even just your security vendor that, Hey, we're seeing a lot of activity around this particular threat and you get some, you know, some indicators, but also maybe some other background around it, um, that you can then do some searches, check on your network, see if maybe you actually did get breached, like you said, six months ago and you just don't know it. Yeah. So there's a little bit of that kind of hunting that's going on, but that, like you say, that's not the true full fledged threat hunting that people talk Threat hunting has become a huge yeah. category, kind of like, I'm going to be a doctor. Well, what kind of doctor are you going to be? Well, threat hunter is like that. It's, it's very complex. But I want to use that to transition, since we're running low on time here, to back to the threat, the pure threat intelligence around threat feeds and what kinds of feeds. Um, because whether you're doing threat hunting or not, when you do investigation, the kinds of data you might need to use is going to be different. I mean, we talked earlier, our very first scenario, I've played around, I've tweaked it, I've got multiple feeds, but I know I've got the ones that are highly accurate, very low false positives, because I don't want to waste a lot of time with too many alerts. But now that I'm on the investigation side, there's a different kind of threat intelligence. You want to kind of explain that? Yeah, so, um, and uh, I'm going to go off into a couple of different directions based on that more open, open uh, uh, topic. But, you know, threat intelligence, you know, I'm going to start off with threat intelligence, you know, often falls into a couple of different categories. You've got, uh, you know, the simplest of them are like host names, IP addresses. These are, are, you know, literal locations out there in the internet that you've seen associated with malicious behavior. Um, hosts are usually, um, you, know, you know, host names are, are usually uh, a little bit less ephemeral, a little bit more targeted. IP addresses, you have to be a little bit more careful about blocking because they may, you know, obviously be serving the host, but they may also be associated with other things as well. Then you get down to, you know, you know, uh, more and more surgical, you know, style like URLs, uh, you know, a URL is probably going to stay bad for a long period of time. Uh, a, a file hash is associated with, you know, how do you identify a specific piece of malware? It's usually through a file hash that's going to have some, some legs, you know, there's never going to be a circumstance for that, that file hash ever, uh, suddenly starts being uh, uh, benign as opposed to malicious. So, you know, those types of uh, threat intelligence, all these different things have a different shelf life, a different time to live. Um, and on that same standpoint, just sort of going back to a topic that you had mentioned earlier and then and just sort of coming back again here, um, you know, 
so often you see like that that FBI warning or U.S. cert issues some sort of a new uh, you know, announcement about you know about sunburst, etc. And they're going to say, "Here's yeah, you know, we know about this new threat. This threat has been going since last February. It's a, you know, it, and now we're ready to talk about it. And here are the IP addresses. Here are the host names. Here are the URLs. Here are the file hashes associated with this threat. And that's wonderful that they're telling us now." Uh, but at the point in time where it goes into a U.S. cert, you know, boom, a bulletin, the chances of any of those things even being active anymore are, are pretty minimal. <laughs> I mean, you know, like, you know, you know, uh, the cover's been blown and they're going to, I mean, like maybe the, the file hashes will still end up kicking around for a while, but those IP addresses are already dark. Those IP you know, host names are dark. You know, they're not going to continue using this stuff once they know that they're, they're well known. And you know, if the FBI hasn't gone in and taken those things down already, so what do you do with that information once you've done it? You know, it would really have been nice if you had known about this six months ago, but a lot of times you have because you've got these devices like your DNS servers and your you know, your proxies, etc. They are serving off these logs, and if you can if you can trace the you know, if you can store that for any reasonable length of time. When you find out about these new threats, it's not really threat hunting because yeah, you know, threat hunting is you know, going out there and finding new things that nobody ever knew about. But you know, here you're finding out, you know, like somebody knows about it, it's probably dead. But it would be really nice for me to be able to go back four or five months and see, you know, did anybody in the last four months ever hit that IP address? Did anybody in you know hit that host name? Because whether you know, if somebody did, there's a good chance that 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 threat is active in my network now. Uh, and whether or not there are any indicators that are showing up now, uh, and maybe nobody will ever hit that IP address again, but Bob in accounting, I, I shouldn't use your name as a, as a <laughs> uh, bad example, sorry. Uh, but uh, you know, this guy in accounting uh, uh, hit this IP address three months ago, and just today I found out that it's malicious. You know, I wanna go over and I wanna do some real forensics on his laptop to make sure that you know he isn't harboring something that he's unaware of. Yeah, and uh, you know this is where you know those alerts come through, but also um, there are other sources of feed. So you get the alerts. You know you want to want to monitor and 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 get on those mailing lists. Um, you also want to mon monitor social media. You'll read wonderful things. Uh, Brian Krebs and others are always talking about developments out there. Um, particularly when something's been seen in another industry, perhaps, and all of a sudden now it's being used in your industry. That's not a new technique. These guys develop it with an idea in mind. When they've exhausted all that they can, made as much as they can, they shift to something else. So that's that's new. Um, I think what I'm going to try and do here, since uh, we keep running out of time on this, is we'll probably try for a part three. And um, maybe we'll bring on um, your cohort, David, and uh, dig into an actual tool, uh, kind of a truth in, in lending to the listeners. We're going to go ahead and demonstrate. Uh, my thought is we'll demonstrate uh, a dossier tool that we have ourselves. It'll give you an example of how certain tools can help you bring it together because there are options for SIM and SOAR. We'll discuss all the tools, but I think we need to come back and just drill in to make this more actionable for everybody. But, um, you know, we've run out of time. And, Drew, I want to thank you again for coming back, and I'm going to try and get you a third time. Yeah, you, know, you can just have me keep on talking until I run out of something to say. It'll probably take <laughs> us through 2025. <laughs> Not a problem. And I want to thank our viewers and listeners for your time. Join us next time as we continue our efforts to help you stay on top of cybersecurity and ahead of cyber risks on Threat Talk.